Right, thank you very much. Well, my job is to talk about the role of targets in trying to deliver a circular economy in Scotland. I wanted to start just by talking a little bit about what the circular economy is. This is a diagram from the Dutch government programme for a circular economy, and it's from 2016. And the left-hand side is kind of where we started, which is you dig some stuff up, you make it into something, it gets used, and then it's waste. The middle one, they call it reuse economy, but actually it's recycling economy. That's kind of where we're at. You dig stuff up, you make something, sometimes you get some of that back, and then you produce waste. And circular economy, the thing that we have been talking about, is trying to get, as much as possible, things going round and round in loops. So it's a nice simple concept, obviously very difficult in practice. So why is that important? Well, uh, John's done a great job talking about the, um, the impact that we have and the hidden impact of our consumption when we're just looking at our climate emissions. But I want to talk about the impact at the other end. This is uh, the Living Planet Index, which is something that WWF produce every year or two. And it looks at populations of animals around the planet. So this is looking at the decline since 1970 of the populations of important species around the world. And these are marine species, freshwater species, and land species. And the decline has been about 60% since 1960. So this is about climate change. It's about <coughs> land being taken for cities and for agriculture. And it's about the minerals that we're digging up and displacing nature. So that is the impact that we, Western societies, are having around the planet. And one way to look at that impact is with the ecological footprint. This is a methodology that's been around for about 25 years. And it's a way of trying to look at all of the different impacts that we have and putting them into a common measure so you can see what's happening. So it's sort of symbolic, but it comes out with some numbers. And this graph is looking at uh, the grazing land that we use. So this is a global picture. The forest products that we use, the fishing grounds that we use, the crop lands, and the built up land. And then the big bit at the bottom is our climate emissions. The dotted line is one planet's worth. So that you can see in about the late 70s, we went into planetary overdraft as a global society. And we're now globally at about 1.8 planets. So we're using the resources of 1.8 planets when we've only got one. So that clearly can't go on. But that's the global picture. In Scotland, if you do this sort of calculation, you'd decide that we're a three-planet society. Now, in Scotland, we obviously have a circular economy discussion. We have a strategy, which has been widely welcomed some years ago. We have a bill that's brewing. We have the DRS coming, which is very positive. But some of the basics, even, we're not quite getting right. So if you look at recycling rates, they actually fell the last year that we reported on them. And they're under 50%, which is well off track for our 2020 target. We recently had to postpone the ban on landfilling of biodegradable waste because we were not ready for it. And there's a great danger that the consequence of that will be stimulating more incinerators around Scotland. Now, if you build incinerators, I see Morris is keen on that. <laughs> Morris is very keen on the idea of not having more incinerators. Um, the consequence of building more incinerators is you have to feed them, and that means you don't get good at recycling, you don't get good at reducing, you don't get good at avoiding in those terms. So we need to get the basics right, but we also need to think what is a circular economy for Scotland, and how can this bill that's coming, this bill which will we'll probably not have another circular economy or waste bill for another decade, so this is the opportunity, and if we miss this opportunity, we lock ourselves into a decade of not being very good at this. Um, I have a PhD in astronomy, and I don't get to use it very much, so I'm just going to have a little digression about three planets. So just to examine our nearest neighbours, this is Venus, and it's a similar size to the Earth, so that's quite good, but it has a, suffers from a runaway greenhouse effect. So the surface temperature is about 470 degrees centigrade. Its temperature is, its pressure is about 80 atmospheres, and the nice white clouds made of sulfuric acid and the rest of the atmosphere is mostly carbon dioxide. So if you stepped outside of your spaceship, before you could be poisoned, you would be crushed, boiled and dissolved. So that is not a planet whose resources we're going to be using. And this is Mars going the other way out. It's rather smaller than the Earth. The gravity is about a third of the Earth, so that might be quite nice for some of us. 
The average temperature is minus 40, and there's less than a hundredth of the atmosphere that we have here, and most of that's CO2, and the Martians don't seem to be very friendly when we send things to them. So despite Elon Musk's enthusiasm, we're not going there and using those resources in any big way anytime soon. So we're stuck with this one, and it's got quite a nice temperature on average. Uh, it's got quite a sensible gravity. It's actually got quite a lot of food, but we don't distribute it very well. But it's really rather messed up. There have been attempts to look at this resource question before. So two that I've been involved with are this one, 23 years ago, which looked at the concept of environmental space, which is a bit like an ecological footprint, and again talked about across Europe, how do we set targets. And this one, 12 years ago, which was about ecological footprint, which John was involved with. <laughs> so if only people had listened 23 and 12 years ago, we might be in a better place. But hang on, it's okay because we have a circular economy bill coming, so surely we can get it right this time. So, circular economy bill, we have the proposals, and we will see a bill, perhaps in March and April, introduced. Parliament will get its time to discuss it, to take evidence from experts, and to dissect it. So what's in the proposals? Um, well, there are lots of good things. There's nothing really bad in these proposals. Um, there are some possibly quite fundamental things. So the consultation asks about householders' obligations to help with the resource question. So if you did something in the bill when it comes about putting more of an obligation on householders, that might actually be quite fundamental. So possibly that's very helpful. There's uh, a co the, the idea that we should put a circular economy obligation on pub the public sector. So the public sector spends billions every year on procurement, and if that was done in a better way, that would clearly make a difference. So those are two quite fundamental things. There are lots of quite small things in here, so, under the section which is about reduce, the most exciting thing is about the latte levy. So if that's the most exciting thing we can think of on one of the three top concepts of avoid, then clearly there's not enough in there. <laughs> so, it needs more work. We have time to do that because this was a consultation, there have been lots of responses, government's having to think about it, and then there will be bill and there will be parliamentary scrutiny. But this is the time to try and influence government to say, the thing we need in here that will make a real difference is something. And to us, it's targets. We don't have to look very far for an example that works reasonably well, and that's in our climate acts, where we have targets and plans and reports to Parliament. And that's the kind of model <coughs> that we would like to see. And you'll hear in a moment what's happening in France, but there are several countries in Europe which are quite well advanced in thinking about what they're going to do about circular economy. The Dutch example, so I used their diagram earlier, but they've set targets to have a fully circular economy by 2050, and on the way to that, a 50% reduction in their use of materials by 2030. They don't quite know how to do it, I think, and they haven't quite worked out how to measure it, but these are good, ambitious targets of the kind of scale that's necessary. So that's the kind of thing that we would like to see for Scotland. And just... Uh, thinking about other countries, as I say, you'll hear about France. Finland has a very ambitious set of targets. Slovenia is doing lots of work. Italy and Germany are both doing interesting work. And across Europe, there are 60 countries or regions which have a, a circular economy plan of some sort. Now, we have a circular economy strategy in Scotland, of course, and we've had that for uh, two or three years. So we are one of those 60 uh, nations or regions. But there's a lot of work going on in this area. It's not, sometimes we sit in Scotland and think, oh, we've got to do this difficult thing, let's invent it from scratch. But actually, there's lots of useful stuff we can learn from out there. So, what is the value of looking at the climate acts? Well, you've seen some of the, this, uh, these figures from John, and these are the Scottish uh, domestic emissions. So this is just what comes from stuff happening in Scotland and around Scotland. This is not uh, the energy that was used and the CO2 that was created in making our washing machines or our cars, so that's all the consumption side. But if your aim in the Climate Act is to set up something which makes good progress on those territorial emissions, then we seem to be doing a good job, and we seem to have set some interesting, ambitious kind of targets. So the blue line is the 2009 Act, and the red line is the 2019 Act that we've just passed. So we have increased our ambition. 
And the reason that this is helpful, and I was involved in trying to strengthen the 2009 bill before it became an act, and the same for the 2019 bill before it became an act. Uh, so I've had a long experience of how this works. And it seems to me that the value of this is that we set the direction, we have targets both long-term and short-term. We have an obligation for ministers to turn up in Parliament and tell you how they're doing. And there's also an obligation in the Acts to tell you what they're going to do about it if they're not doing well enough. We have plans, so there's a climate change plan which tells you this, over the next five years, this is what we're going to do to meet the targets over the next five years. So that means Scottish government civil servants in various departments have to go out and talk to their stakeholders and work out what are we doing about agriculture, what are we doing about transport, what are we doing about homes. So you start to engage society in how do we deliver these targets that Scotland has set itself. Uh, there's even an obligation in the 2009 Act to measure consumption emissions. So that's why John gets that piece of work. <coughs> and that was one of the positive things that we got into that 2009 Act. So although there are no targets for those consumption emissions, there is an obligation to at least be aware of what they are and report on them. Uh, so this is quite complementary then to materials. So if we had a set of targets, a duty to report every year on how we're doing, a duty to produce plans that say in each sector what are we doing about resource consumption and resource efficiency. That would be very complementary to this, which is just looking at <coughs> the climate question and it's just looking at the territorial side of things. So that model to us, it pretty much works. You can argue about you know, which sectors have got off a bit lightly, but we're definitely moving in the right direction. We've definitely increased the ambition. And so this model seems to be the right one to apply to the circular economy and our resource efficiency. So that's my pitch to you. We've got a successful model in the Climate Bill. Let's do something very similar when we uh, vote through a final circular economy bill. Thank you.